turn up the volume and free your mind because this is the Humans 2.0 podcast hosted by Mark Metry. What you feed your mind every day will shape your future. Listening to this podcast will strengthen your mind, thoughts, and beliefs. Leave behind the everyday mundane trivialities of your average human version 1.0 and meta-learn your way into becoming a human version 2.0 with a new upgraded guest in each episode. Enjoy. Dr. Kirk Parsley is a sleeping expert. Kirk served as an undersea medical officer at the Naval Special Warfare Group 1 from June 2009 to January 2013. Over there, he led the world's first sports medicine rehabilitation center for Navy SEALs. Dr. Parsley has been a member of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine since 2006 and has served as a Naval Special Warfare's expert on sleep medicine. After leaving the Navy, he went into concierge medicine and consulting. He continues to consult for multiple corporations and professional athletes and teams. Dr. Parsley lectures worldwide on sleep, wellness, hormonal optimization, and is currently writing a book right now on sleep. Guys, Sleep is pivotal. If anything, it is the cornerstone of your life. If you're not sleeping enough and if you're not sleeping well enough, you're missing out on you don't even know. If you want to learn more, definitely listen to this podcast because I learned a lot about Dr. Parsley and sleep in general. And if you enjoyed this, I would highly appreciate leaving a review on iTunes because it helps the show grow in ways you can't even imagine. Enjoy. Dr. Kirk, how do you spend your time here on planet Earth? Uh, mostly I breathe. Uh, do, that's what I do more than I do anything else. Um, I guess, uh, well, I mean, I, I guess I'm in a fortunate position at this point in my life to where I spend my time on planet Earth uh, either pursuing passions or developing passions. Um, so that... Could be personal, could be health related, it could be my own fitness, could be my relationships, could be business, whatever. But whatever I whatever I'm really passionate about at the time is what I wake up and I do until I'm not passionate about it, and then I do something else. Glad glad to hear that. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> so Dr. Kirk, I you know, I got you on because sleep is a huge, huge issue. Um I had on this podcast before the Julian Martin. He's the CEO of the world's first sleeping robot. Um, you know, he kind of talked to me about it. This sleep, this sleep thing is a huge problem. You mm. know, my freshman year in college, man, I would, I would try to go to sleep. I'd close my eyes and then I would just be awake for straight up eight hours straight. Mm -hmm. And that, that caused so many issues, depression, anxiety, all sorts of different, you know, different issues. So I'm really glad you're on here today. So I think to kind of get things started, Dr. Kirk, how did how'd you find yourself down this, this passion of helping people with their sleep problems? Yeah, well, I mean, the, I guess the interesting thing is that, well, I guess like most, <laughs> um, most uh, interesting stories, it, it just really wasn't expected. So it's not like I ever pursued sleep. Uh, you know, on my own or for my own benefit, or um, I never had any deep insight to it and just realized that everybody was wrong and, and um, you know, decided to go on a crusade to educate the world or anything like that. Um, it, it was really when I went back to the SEAL teams as, as their physician and all these guys were having problems that didn't really make any sense. I mean, these are the most performant men in the world. Mm. Um and, you know, men and women, we had to, you know, some uh, support staff that are, you know, pretty damn active and pretty, uh, you know, pretty, pretty aggressive schedules as well. Um, and, you know, the, you know, they're, like I said, I mean, they're, they're super high performing people. They're motivated. Obviously, they're motivated. Obviously, they're disciplined. Um, you know, they're incentivized 
to uh, perform well. And, um, you know, it's really their identity, like in like a professional athlete or something, your identity as a SEAL is a, as, a, as a SEAL. Uh, probably one of the things that causes the most marital conflicts is that they're SEALs first and, you know, SEALs are their identity and, and the SEAL teams are their priority. So, that, you know, you put all those things in there and you're like, well, how can these guys be having problems? Yeah, I mean, so the, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. These guys have all these problems and, yeah, they're talking about, you know, low motivation, uh, concentration issues, memory issues, uh, emotionality, uh, you know, depressive symptoms, probably not any truly depressed guys, you know, some sexual dysfunction, some, um, I don't know. Uh, and then, you know, relying on medications to help them alleviate some of this. And then, of course, they just... It's not that a lot of them complained of insomnia, and they didn't complain of insomnia because the culture doesn't value sleep enough to consider that a problem, but they weren't sleeping well, and they knew they weren't sleeping well, but it just really wasn't one of their complaints, um, and so, the, you know, uh, you know, when I first started, you know, with this litany of symptoms these guys were giving me, I didn't have any idea. I'm like, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm a, I'm a Western trained MD. I know how to recognize, diagnose and treat disease. Nobody had any disease, right? They just weren't performing how they wanted to perform. And I'm like, okay, well, I have no idea. Let me figure it out. And so I, I first thought maybe it's adrenal fatigue because this was around 2009. Um, so they'd been in combat for eight years. So I thought, oh, you know, maybe we just burned out their adrenals. And so I started treating adrenal fatigue and I had a little bit of success, but it wasn't overwhelming. Um, 30% maybe. Uh, some guys got nothing out of the adrenal treatment. Um, so I'm like, well, that might be part of it, but it's not all of it. I just did these enormous lab sets to just search for any possible thing I could possibly correlate. Um, and I started training with these alternative medicine doctors. Um, who now call themselves integrative and functional medicine doctors and they've you know, all over the board, but basically non-traditional people, non-traditional uh, doctors. And um, yeah, I was in a great position because I, I was the physician for the seals. And so I could say, Hey, you know, I'm a physician for the West coast seals. I could really use your help. I read your book. I listened to your podcast, whatever. Can I come and train with you for a week? Can I consult with you? Can we, you know, maybe have a Skype call if we had Skype back then, whatever we had back then, um, you know, could we have a video call and do some training? And and that's how I really started ed educating myself on this. And, um, you know, one of the first things that came up was this vitamin D3 deficiency, which was kind of new in those days. Uh, Rob Wolf had maybe been talking about it for a year, but other than that, there wasn't a whole lot of buzz around vitamin D3. And uh, all my guys were vitamin D3 deficient, which made sense, right? I mean, they work at night, sleep during the day. If they do mm. go outside the day, they're covered from head to toe in camouflage and, you know, hats and goggles and gloves and boots. And so they're not getting any sun exposure. So, all right, that makes sense. Um, and then that was, you know, has a lot of benefits. But one of the benefits was is, is that it was uh, attached to sleep in about maybe – I mean, this is how smart I am. Probably after a hundred guys sat in the chair and told me the same thing, it just kind of snapped in my head like a light bulb went off. And it's like, oh, you know, he says he uses sleep aids every night. I think a lot of guys have told me that. So then I go back to my records and every single guy who had come to see me was using sleep drugs, either their prescription sleep drugs or over-the-counter sleep drugs. Um, or alcohol as their sleep aid, or all three. <laughs> uh, so, or any combination thereof. So um, I said, well, all right, let me see if there's anything to that. Cause I didn't know anything about sleep. I never had a single class in medical school on sleep. Um, mm, wow. And so, you know, looking to the medical literature and it's like, well, you know, I encourage people to journal and, uh, you know, relax and do, you know, whatever, you know, kind of, well, bullshit sleep hygiene thing they had going on. I'm, I'm sorry, you're PG or <laughs> show whatever you want. All right, scratch that. Um, and 
And after that, you give them sleep drugs, the Z drugs. And after that, you give them benzos. And after that, you give them sedatives and hypnotics until you, you've just drugged these people into submission. Um, and that didn't seem like the right thing to do to me. So I said, well, let me figure out what actually happens when you sleep and what's going on. And and it was the unifying theory. I mean, it was the Occam's razor of the whole thing. When I saw, the, uh, when I really started learning about sleep, um, you know, I I realized, well, this this is the only thing of every possibility that I've looked at is the only thing that explains everything. Every single symptom could have been explained by sleep. So I'm like, All right, that's the place to start. So. Uh, yeah, I just went on about educating myself and educating the unit and you know the, the group and you know, helping guys improve their sleep and let's see what happens from there. Yeah. So and these Navy SEALs, they were exercising. Oh, you know, were, were they eating? Yeah. Right? So we. Wow. So yeah. you know, when I, I when I got there, I got there at a very fortuitous time. Um, if you know anything about the military, it takes about ten to fifteen years to actually get anything done. So. Um, about 10 years before I showed up, I think literally nine years before I showed up, um, there had been this initiative for what they were calling the tactical athlete program, uh, which to the surprise of most everyone, uh, was the SEALs first attempt at treating SEALs in any sort of special fashion, uh, as though they were athletes or top performers or anything like that. So we didn't have a sports medicine facility. Um, we didn't even have sports medicine doctors. I mean, we just had regular doctors there. We didn't have strength and conditioning coaches. We didn't have nutritionists. We didn't have athletic trainers. We didn't have physical therapists. We didn't have anything. These guys were just relegated to regular sick call like any other military member. So there was really nothing there for them. And somebody said, well, you know, we really should organize all of this and you know, create a program, something like a college would have to take care of their athletes because our guys are essentially athletes, right? Um, and, uh, so I got there really right when I got funded. And so I got to build it. Uh, they put me in charge of building the sports medicine facility. I had a really, really good background in sports medicine. I'd actually thought I was going to be a physical therapist for a while. So I hired all these physical therapists, PT assistants, athletic trainers. I was involved in hiring exercise physiologists, strength and conditioning coaches, nutritionists, all this. So we had all this stuff in place. Um, and, you know, SEALs are fanatical about their fitness and physiques anyway. So, like, you know, these guys had already been listening to podcasts and reading books and, you know, trying to fine tune their nutrition and exercise programs on their own for the, for the most part. But now we had a systematic way of doing that. We, I mean, we got the best people in the country. I mean, we took people from professional sports teams. We got people out of the Olympic Training Center. We got people, you know, like the number one CrossFit athlete at the time was uh, Josh Everett. And you know, we pulled him as a, in as one of our strength and conditioning coaches. And like we had like, you know, you name it, like we had, these guys had resources and the guys who came to see me were the guys who were really using those resources. Right. I mean, the young guys who can drink beer and, you know, go out party, chase girls and still perform the next day because they're 22. Like those go, those aren't the guys who come to see me. It's the guys who are, you know, 35 plus still trying to keep up with the 22 year olds and be who they were when they were 22. <clears throat> those are the guys who are struggling, but those are also the guys who, you know, are you know, damn well doing their very smart exercise programming, very good nutrition, like, you know, taking care of themselves and nobody thought of sleep. And so uh, that was kind of the missing piece. And now, I mean, what nearly, you know, you know, I mean, about nine years later, <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything more important than sleep. I, I don't care what you want to get better at. I, I don't even care if you want to get better. Like if you just want to survive, if you just want to be who you are right now, if you just want to decline at a slow rate, like it doesn't matter whatever your goal is in life. Sleep is critical and probably the most important thing. And you know, obviously I read a ton about it now and everybody in the world sends me articles about it. And, uh, you know, I, I get in all sorts of conversations with other, um, you know, professionals, sleep experts and other, you know, related fields. And I, I really think it's the most important thing. Most, it's not only the most important thing that's being overlooked, but it is the most important thing, period, full stop. 
just is. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I definitely want to ask you this, but based on my research and all the science that I've read, nobody actually knows what sleep is. Would I be correct in saying that? You would be kind of correct in saying that. Nobody can define what sleep is, but you know Mm, what sleep is. Yeah. And I know what sleep is because we've done it, right? We both do it all the time, so we know what it is. How do we define it? That's that's not um, an open shut case. If -hmm. you get into the sleep researchers, um, so the people who actually run the field of sleep medicine founded by William Dement um, and Charles Zeichler Zeichler, um, at Harvard would probably be William Dement's replacement if you're going to choose who's in charge of of sleep medicine is probably him. Um, Though those guys both define sleep the same way. um, And they basically say there's a barrier between you and your environment. And then you can be awakened. And they call that sleep. So if you're knocked Mm -hmm. unconscious, or if you drink yourself unconscious, you can't be awakened. But there's a barrier between you and the environment. If you take drugs, even sleep drugs, right? There's a barrier between you and the environment. You're not aware of your environment. Maybe you can be awakened. Maybe you can't. Mm. You probably can't. So it's probably not sleep. (laughs) So you can wake somebody up on Ambien and you might think they're (laughs) awake, but they won't think they're awake. They don't have any realization of what's going on. So I submit that, you know, sleep on a lot of sleep drugs, even drugs designed for that purpose, isn't sleep. Yeah. So I define it with one more step. Not that I think I'm smarter than these guys, but I just think it's all inclusive. If you say there's a barrier between you and your environment, you can be awakened and there's predictable sleep patterns going on. Right. It doesn't have to be perfect sleep patterns, but your brain waves are organized in a way that we recognize as sleep. Um, because we know very much what brain waves being unconscious look like and brain waves being drugged unconscious look like and brain waves of sleep and brain waves of meditation and everything that looks like sleep, we know what those brain waves look like. And if those brain waves are cycling up and down in a predictable pattern, I think that's I think you have to have that route to be called sleep. Otherwise it's just unconsciousness in my mind. Mm. That's really but, interesting. But anyway, to answer your question, yes, there's not a hundred percent consensus upon what sleep is defined as yeah Yeah, i see that's very interesting so you know like so the majority of the people that come to you what is it the fact that they're not sleeping enough or is the fact that the quality of their sleep isn't good is it they can't fall asleep what what do you see is like the major issue and maybe the the root causes of it Mm, well i mean so my exposure is is different than i mean it's varied right so i have private clients that hire me um and that could be an individual that could be a corporation that could be uh, a a municipality like a fire department police department um, whatever you know a professional sports team somebody who wants my consultation um those those are different than say people who come to see me for medical problems right like they're saying mm-hmm. hey i'm broken or i'm breaking uh yeah, those people usually present with the problems that i explained to you the seals were having right that they come to me with these sort of vague syndrome that mm-hmm. um because i'm really clever i called it the seal syndrome um and uh it, you know, it, it was just kind of a combination about all the things I listed out to you. And then if you look at the lab markers, you can add lab markers that correlate with that. So the, you know, usually have low anabolic state, high inflammatory state, high oxidative state, and all those types of things. Very predictable. <clears throat> um, so broken people come to see me really with those complaints. Um, mm-hmm. the people who want to be more performant just come to me with like, hey, make me better they might want nutritional advice. They might want exercise advice. They might want, you know, mindset, stress mitigation, or they might want help with sleep or they just want, might want a whole package. So um, like most of my individual clients are just, 
you know, I want to be a little better and here's my goals. Um, and then, you know, well, I want to be a little bit better. And then we define their goals and we, and then we set annual goals and quarterly goals. And, and what I usually end up teaching them, uh, first and foremost is how important sleep is and how much even they need to sleep. Right. It's like, yeah, even you, I mean, it's, it's important to the whole world, but even you also you, even though you're the CEO of the biggest company in the world or the top, whatever you need sleep too. And so once I convince people they need sleep, then they start sleeping. Uh, but you know, my whole approach to medicine, I mean, if you want to call it medicine, I'm not sure that I'm truly in the medical field anymore. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a health coach with an MD, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So I do, you know, I, I take people who are not sick, you know, people who don't have disease for the most part uh, and, and they just want to be better at something and some of them want to be better parents some of them want to be better spouses some of them want to be better at their business some of them want to be better athletes doesn't matter uh, so that it, it's a big variation now the people who contact me say for like you know to use my sleep supplement or to use some uh or you know to get some specific advice that's usually uh, either people with insomnia or people who work shifts work Mm. Or they just have such a busy job they can't sleep enough. Like, you know, they're climbing the corporate ladder and they're, you know, fresh out of law school or, you know, fresh out of medical school or, you know, they just joined a big accounting firm and they've been out of their MBA for one year or whatever. And they, you know, they have to work 100 hours a week and try to balance their lives. And so, that you know, that that's who calls me for those issues. Yeah. Mm. I see. So... You know, you, you talked about fatigue, people thinking they don't need sleep that mm -hmm. much. And that, that seems to be like the main, the main catalyst for all their issues. What, aside from that, like what, what are the factors that, that heavily affect your sleep that people might not be aware of? Well, I think it's important to restate what you said at the beginning is that the number one reason people don't sleep enough is because they don't sleep well enough is because they believe it to be a luxury and that's mm -hmm. social programming. And that's, you know, not that long, maybe a hundred years of social programming. Um, so that's the first thing to get past and that can only be gotten past with education. So when we do a podcast, I'm not expecting any of your listeners to go, that changed my life. I expect them to go, well, hey, that sounds really important. Well, let me go read more about that. And then they go do research and then they can change their life. Right? I can't change your life in an hour or 45 minutes or whatever we're doing. So, um, you know, that that's uh, the number one thing. Like we have to get there. And I guess the number two and three thing is is really kind of part of the first thing is that I explain to people what actually happens when you sleep. So that education piece, it's like this is when you're getting better at everything. So this is the motivation to sleep. If if I mean, we had this thing in the SEAL teams called a million dollar test, right? The million dollar test was if I gave you a million dollars, could you figure out how to do this? So if I gave you a million dollars to sleep eight hours a night for the next month, would you be able to figure out how to do that? I guarantee so. you. <laughs> so it's all motivation, right? You have the internet, you know, somebody who has the internet, you have access to a bookstore, a library, you can figure it out. I guarantee you. Uh, so, you yeah, know, that, that's kind of uh, the next most important thing really. And, and it's really part of the same thing. So convince people that they need sleep and then, you know, inspire people or, you know, foster interest in people to educate themselves about sleep. Once they really value it, they'll figure out a way to do it. And everybody's problems are a little different. I mean, there's some usual things that we've all heard of the screen time, you know, electric lighting, um, you know, being too busy, being stressed out right before bed, using caffeine too late, um, eating super high carbohydrates diets, you know, before you go to bed, um, you know, poorly controlled metabolic disorders or like all those types of things are obvious. We've all heard of all those things. Um, but again, it's really 
if people value it enough, they'll figure out a way to do it. And for everybody's different. I mean, I have guys your age and they want to use you know, 17 tracking devices and log everything <laughs> on their computers and have apps running and they want to, they want to measure everything they can possibly measure. Um, and that's fine. And then I have, you know, old school guys who, you know, whatever they, they run a construction business or, you know, they, the garbage trucks in their city or whatever. And they're kind of crotchety old guys and they can't sleep. You know, I'm, I'll be lucky if I can get that guy to journal. Right. I mean, he'll probably like write down what time he went to sleep and write down what time he woke up and that's about it. So it doesn't matter. I mean, if whatever, whatever they're willing to do, I meet them with where, where they're at. Mm, I see. But it's and- really, if, if I can just blather about that, I think I, I can answer question more completely there's really two things involved in not going to sleep one is the photo period right the light exposure Hmm. the other is stimulation that's really all there is to it when we use the sun as our cue the way we're designed as a species this organism was designed to respond to the sun when the sun goes down a lot of brain changes happen those brain changes lead to chemical shifts in our brain and chemical shifts in our body and (laughs) If we're not engaging our environment, what happens is our environment slowly disappears. And once there's a barrier between us and our environment, we're asleep. And then we wake up out of that, right? That's really all there is to it. So you either need to, it's, if you're having problems sleeping, it's either photo period or it's some sort of stimulation. It could be actual physical stimulation. It could be what's racing around in your head, doesn't matter. Uh, bankruptcy, divorce, death of a spouse, or trying to work, you know, and finish a project that's due the next morning that you have to give a presentation to a bunch of people you're intimidated to present in front of. Okay. Like it's all the same. Yeah. I see. Is it, is the whole eight hour thing, does that stand for most people or Mm -hmm. um, I see? Okay. And is it true that the healthy the healthier you are, the less sleep you need and sicker people need more. Okay. No. So it is possible that sick people need more sleep depending on what their illness is. Right. Well, of course they need more sleep because sleep is when you restore. That's when you're repairing. That's the only time they're getting rid of their disease or, you know, really beating back their diseases while they're asleep. So of course they should be getting more sleep. Are they capable of more sleep is a different question. Um, But the truth about sleep is it's just like nutrition. It's just like exercise. It's like any part of being a human being. It's not the same every day where that seven and a half, the the number is seven and a half hours plus or minus 30 minutes. So anywhere from seven to eight hours is a normal night of sleep given a just very usual day of usual behavior for a common person. Right. Um, If you're an Olympic athlete, or trying to be an Olympic athlete, you probably need 10 hours of sleep a day, right? Um, and then there are a few outliers, and by few, I'm going to say 0.0001% who might actually perform at their best with less, significantly less than seven hours. But no research has ever shown that. <laughs> so there's nobody in the labs. And so all, the, all that we've ever done, where that number comes from, is that when people, when we don't sleep enough, we we build up debt, right? Mm. Uh, if you think about sleep is, sleep is preparing your body to handle tomorrow, your brain and your body, if you want to separate those two out. So it's preparing you to handle tomorrow. If you wake up tomorrow with not enough resources to do tomorrow, you still have to do tomorrow. So you have to borrow those resources from somewhere else, right? So now you're changing fuel partitioning in your body and you're changing you know, what, you know, what reactions are going on and which reactions aren't. You're shunting blood flow. Like there's all these different things that you're doing. You're secreting more stress hormones to give you more adrenaline. Like there's a, there's a physiological cost, but you're going into the debt. We call that a sleep debt. Had you slept enough, you wouldn't need all those changes. So the fact you need those changes, that's a little debt, 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 debt. Add that up. How long do you carry that debt? How big can that debt be? We don't know the answer to that. What we do know is that almost everybody's carrying a sleep debt, though. So 
the way these the way the number came about the first one again was William Demand. It was the bunker trials, and what they did is they took old bunkers, World War II bunkers that were just cold concrete rooms with no windows and no light, and they put a bed in there and they put a toilet in there, and they hired college students and said, "We're going to put you in this room for 14 hours a day, and then we're going to let you out for 10 hours a day. You do whatever you want to do, and then you come back, and we're going to pay you, and probably during the summer break or something, right?" Um, so they get college and graduate students to do that. And what they found is that the average person slept 12 and a half hours when they put them in this room for 14 hours. But over the course of 30 days, by the end of 30 days, everybody was sleeping seven and a half hours plus or minus half an hour. Mm. So they, and if you continued it for two more months, everybody slept seven and a half hours plus or minus half an hour. That's where that average turned out to be. And so then they said, okay, let's go one step further on this. So once we've paid back all of our sleep debt, we're out of debt. We call that sleep adapt adapted. You completely sleep adapted. And you say, at this point, we're calling this your physiological peak. You're the best you're going to be with sleeping the, you know, for the factor we're measuring. This is the best you're going to perform. So we give you a test, a task. We teach you how to type with your left hand only or respond to uh, a light or a physical skill, play the piano, you know, a sports, whatever. It didn't matter. We're going to teach you some skill and test you on that skill. Or we're going to take a skill that is your skill. We're going to test you on it with the sleep. Now, tomorrow night, instead of sleeping eight hours, you're going to sleep six hours. And then we're going to test you that next morning. And when we test you the next morning, they do worse. Doesn't matter. I don't care what it is. They do worse at it. But when you ask them, they know they did worse. And then mm. day two, you only let them sleep six hours again. They do worse again. They know they did worse. Day three, same thing. But by day four, they're all saying, I think I did as well as I've ever done. I feel totally normal. I've adapted to this schedule. So it's just like being drunk. It's like being slightly drunk. And there's lots of correlated, uh, correlative studies where they say, you know, being awake for these, this many hours is on par with the performance of somebody with a blood alcohol level of this, right? And so being at the legal or the illegal limit um, of blood alcohol while driving a vehicle is only being awake for about 18 hours. Um, so if you're if you're mm. somebody who's doing shift work, I mean, I used to work 30, 36 hour shifts at the hospital all the time. Um, I ride my bicycle home through traffic and I was drunk. Right. I mean, I, I was probably I was probably performing as though I had a blood alcohol level of, you know, point one or something like I was because I'd been up 36 hours in a row and working really hard um, and not really eating very much. And so, I mean, that's really common. And I just felt like that was normal because it's like anything else, right? I mean, is being underwater normal? Yeah, if you're a fish. But do you even know you're in water if you're a fish? Not until you get pulled out. So it's not until people get sleep adapted that they go, oh my God, yeah, this is different. And that happens with my clients all the time. Once I get them to sleep for even a week, they're like, oh, they're like man, it's so much more colorful. The lights are so much brighter. I'm so, I, everything seems happier. Like their whole life changes. Wow. Well, that was really interesting. That was, that was going to be my next question. I'm glad you, you said that. Should people go to sleep at the same time every night? Or how if, important is that? Okay, so we have to divide this out. Um, mm -hmm. If you have sleep difficulties and you're trying to improve your sleep, one of the things I would recommend is being on a consist, uh, consistent sleep schedule. I've never had any problems sleeping. So for me, it's just sleeping enough, right? I can stay up till midnight tonight, sleep eight hours and get up at eight o'clock tomorrow. I can go to bed at 10 o'clock tonight and get up at six o'clock tomorrow. I can probably get myself to sleep by nine o'clock if I really wanted to. It's just not that big of a deal. You know, I travel a lot. I don't have any sleep difficulties. As long as I'm getting my quality sleep in and enough sleep and enough quantity enough quality it's not that big of a deal if i had insomnia and i couldn't sleep 
yeah, okay, let, you know, let's get rid of every factor we possibly can. Um, and so then it would be, yeah, you should go to sleep at the same time every day. You should get out of bed at the same time every day because a lot of insomnia is psychological. And so we have to mm -hmm. put rituals in place. Those rituals are what bring you comfort. Those rituals are what train your body into new habits, right? Habit formation is really a ritual. You have to perform a ritual until it just becomes automatic and then it's a habit. But yeah. Um, so yeah, there, you have to divide it out. There's people who have sleep difficulties. Yes, you should be dogmatic. You know, you used to be fastidious with your photo period, with your nutrition, with your sleep timing, with your, you know, everything you could possibly improve. Well, let's improve everything. And then once, for the most part, it's like fitness. What do you have to do to get in shape? Be very regimented, very disciplined, very consistent. I don't care what you're doing. Like, you know, <laughs> there's no magical elixir. But once you're in shape, what do you have to do to stay in shape? Be active, really, right? I mean, you don't really have to be nearly as regimented. If I was 30 pounds overweight and kind of broken and I wanted to get in good shape, I'd have to be really regimented to get in good shape in a finite period of time. If I'm already in good shape and I just want to stay in shape, I might work out five days a week. I might work out one day in two weeks. Like, it, I mean, it's just kind of all over the place. Hmm. Doc, what would be your your advice to say, you know, let's say somebody's out there and something happened. They fell asleep for like an hour and a half and they got stuff to do. What What's the best way for them to optimize, even if they're in a situation like that? Like, what's the what's the best case scenario? So they're only they're only going to get an hour and a half sleep. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, like yeah, like something like out of out of usual, something happens. They don't get the full eight hours. They oh, wake okay, up, so they're, they're shorting themselves of a little sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, honestly, if you're shorting yourself of a little sleep, use some stimulants the next day. Um, be active. Try to sneak in some naps if you can. Literally, a five minute nap makes a difference. Um, mm -hmm. If you if uh, you know if if you're into you know, meditation, especially TM has been shown to have some similar properties in the brain. What's, what's TM? Uh, transcendental meditation. Mm. The one with the mantra and um, the Deepak Chopra-ish kind of one. He spun off his own thing, but that's that's really, it, I mean, it's a really ancient thing, a couple of thousand years okay. old. Um, but yeah, the, if you're into meditation, um, I mean, probably if you're sleep deprived, I'd say just sleep. Even the Dalai Lama said that sleep is the best meditation. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, if you can't frankly sleep, but you can sit in your chair quietly and focus on your breathing and close your eyes for five minutes, it has a big effect. If you can get in a 20 minute nap and you can do three of those a day, great. Eat really well the next day because it's, they eat really well on that day. They, and, and by eat really well, I mean eat really clean <laughs> a lot of people call it uh just eat food all right don't eat processed crap um don't eat a bunch of sugar don't eat uh, you know a bunch of just you know don't eat things in bags and boxes and fast food and all that just eat whole food uh don't overeat but eat frequently because one of the things you're going to have problems with the next day is insulin sensitivity so your blood glucose is going to be off and when the blood glucose is off those changes change of emotionality attention you know, perception of effort, fatigue, pain, all sorts of things. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you can mitigate by using stimulants wisely. Um, one thing, most people over caffeinate. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at the curve for, uh, um, you know, if you, if you put dosage across the bottom, uh, the Y axis, you have, we'll call it um, performance enhancing effects, right? Um, it's what's called a hormetic curve. So it starts here and you go up and up and up and up and somewhere around 200 milligrams, it actually starts decreasing your performance. Mm -hmm. um, and you see this in the behavior of a lot of people who over caffeinate uh, because what happens is they, say they take in 400 milligrams of caffeine. It's really normal, right? I mean, I, I think a large Starbucks coffee has about that much in it. Mm -hmm. So while you're drinking that coffee, if you drink that coffee over the course of an hour or 30 minutes, while you're drinking that coffee, you're feeling better and better and better. 
but now you've taken in 400 milligrams and now your curve is going to start going down. So what do you think they're going to do? I need more coffee. Go for more. They're going to yeah. go for more coffee and it's not going to work because they're already overdosed and it's not, they're not going to feel anything from it. There'll be a psychological advantage to it and that they think they're getting something from it. So there'll be a little placebo, but they're not getting any benefit from it. If you look at their alertness, reaction time, coordination, all that, you'd still see that decline no matter how much caffeine they take over the day. And then, you know, when you do that consistently, or even some people, you know, in a single day, if you just, if you over caffeinate that much, you, I mean, that leads to excessive adrenals, right? I, I mean, cause caffeine, um, you know, the way caffeine works in the, bl- in the brain, um, uh, is, is it, it blocks something called adenosine pro, uh, receptors, but over kind of over the, the course of abusing it uh, or the, the downstream effects from blocking his adenosine receptors ac- essentially ends up in secreting more stress hormones or being more sensitive to the stress hormones that you do have. And so now you're anxious and jittery and you can't concentrate as well and, you know, sweaty and you actually feel fatigued because what happens after a big adrenaline rush, right? You get, Ooh, you, you crash, right? Like you almost get in a car accident five minutes later you're shaking and then 10 minutes after that you want to take a nap right i mean it's just kind of the way the adrenaline goes so yeah absolutely and you know based on my personal experience the biggest things that have helped me with my own sleep is getting my food right um, limiting caffeine and probably the big one for me was sugar um Mm -hmm. i just saw myself kind of like with the caffeine cycle but with sugar i'd like eat it or drink it go up and then I start going down, go for it again. And that just absolutely destroyed my sleep. Dr. Yeah. Kirk, final question. Do you have any experience with people using things like white noise and music and sound for sleep? Because personally me, if I put on something that's consistent, whether that's like a, a, an instrumental music or some fan or something, I'll just knock out instantly. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really common. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, again, I, I don't have sleep difficulties, but one of the things that does make me sleep better is a white noise. Um, Mm -hmm. and I know this from sleeping on airplanes and from sleeping in ships and from, you know, sleeping on various (laughs) military equipments and, um, and, and various environments that have that white noise. Um, I do sleep better with that. Uh, the reason I sleep better with that, I think, though, um, is because I have really bad tinnitus. So I have ringing in both of my ears all the time. And it can be somewhat distracting when I'm trying to go to sleep. Um, and so that can mask that. Um, and so tinnitus is really common. Um, mm. And even to some extent, just other types of physical discomfort can be masked if you're thinking about something else. If like, even if you're not consciously aware that you're thinking about that white noise, like that's occupying some brain space that would ordinarily go to making you realize how bad your leg hurts or something or, you know, whatever your discomfort is. Um, But uh, probably the most common reason for it uh, is that it's a cognitive distractor. So people who say they need the television to go to sleep or read a book to go to sleep or journal to go to sleep or do anything, if they need to do this thing to go to sleep, you will find that that thing they need to do is outside of their normal activities. Nobody says, I need to do emails to fall asleep or I need to, you know, nobody does. I don't need, I need to write to go to sleep. Like I need to you know, write blogs. No. <laughs> they need to read and they're going to read something that has nothing to do with their job <laughs> or, or whatever they're stressed about. They're going to read a novel that distracts them. They're going to watch a television show that distracts them. They're going to listen to something that distracts them. And then distracting you, you can, if you have one of those brains that are just spinning, that's how you get rid of the spin. And once you fall asleep, you can usually stay asleep. Mm, I see. Yeah. Awesome. Dr. Kirk, final thing. I'm going to ask you to leave the, the audience with a, maybe a self-inquisitive open question for people to ask themselves. But before I ask you to do that, 
uh, you know, this, this podcast is called humans 2.0 mm -hmm. and, uh, I think you're, I think you're a great human 2.0 and I think you're, you're helping the world educate on sleep and sleep's affected with so many different problems. So I got to acknowledge you for that. Oh, thank you. Do you have, do you have a question for the audience and maybe the best way for them to get in touch with you? A question for the audience. Well, not so much a, well, not so much a question as a challenge. Mm -hmm. So I throw this challenge out there all the time. Um, I have, you know, for at least seven or eight years, uh, thrown out the challenge of tell me anything that's important to you that isn't affected by how much you sleep. And do your own research on that, right? There isn't anything. As far as I know, that's an open challenge I have. I, I am fully willing to be wrong. If somebody can give me a, show me that case here, this is something that's really important to me and sleep doesn't affect it one way or the other. All right. I'm, I'm open to being wrong and I, you know, I'm truly interested if people have that belief. Um, and like I said, no one proved it to me yet. So that that would be my question. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, just go to my website, uh, Doc Parsley, D-O-C, and then Parsley like the Arab, docparsley.com. Awesome. I actually like that way much better. Thank you for everybody for listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. This has been your host, Mark Knight. Thank you for listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there and you chose to listen to this. Please subscribe, share, and tell a friend about Humans 2.0 so they can improve as well. If you loved listening to that, I would love your feedback whether you're watching this on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and anything else. Keep learning on the Humans 2.0 podcast.